why don't we call roll for the Boston Council? Okay, I can do that. Okay. Sherminsky? Johnson? Yeah. Kloppenberg? Prager? Here. Strauss? Participating by phone. Goodman? Here. Staramatsu? Here. Lynn? Here. Mendoza? Here. Great. And we'll just call roll. And also, since it's a combined uh, meeting, we'll call roll for the Rules Advisory Committee. Okay. Barbary? Here. Brandis? Here. Gardena? Here. Goodman? Here. Aramatsu? Here. Lynn? Here. Yes. Has joined the conference. Who, who's, who is that who just joined? Who just joined by phone? Okay. Double secret. Yes, yes, semi secret. Um, first, if there's any public comment, we would welcome that. Anybody from the public want to make a comment? Um. Just procedurally, we are proceeding uh, at the time. We've convened both the RAC and the Law School Council. And so we are uh, proceeding jointly for the moment. So that would include comments on either part, any part of the agenda addressed to either of those bodies. Uh, and let me just remind everybody a little bit about the law, about the public comment process. If you wish to make a public comment, for those of you present in the room, please step forward and take a seat at the seat indicated at the end of the uh, of the circle here with the microphone. If you're making a public comment, or indeed to those on either body, if you are making a comment, please remember to turn your microphone on before your comment and turn it off when you're done. <laughs> For those of you doing the public comment, you can probably not worry about turning the microphone off so much uh, when you're finished. Um, we will uh, take some public comment a general opportunity for public comment at this time. We may also take some in connection with any given item on the agenda at the chair's prerogative. Uh, and uh, I gather that the chairs are um, Greg Brandis for the RAC and Erica Hirmatsu for the Law School Council to control the, the public comment in both instances. So uh, I was asked to make some reminders. That's what I was uh, uh, going to do. So. At this time, uh, we'll accept general public comment on any matter that's on the agenda, or any matter you wish to address to the to the groups. Greg, this is Laura Palazzolo with Lincoln Law School. I'd like to reserve uh, a minute of public comment after um, the discussion of Appendix One. Uh, we would ordinarily uh, will have public comment after the staff presentation and before discussion by any member of the two committees in this instance. And uh, so I will keep in mind that you'd like to make a comment in the appropriate time frame. Okay, anyone else on the phone uh, who wishes to reserve an opportunity for public comment at that time? Okay, hearing none, uh, no members of the public at this time on general matters. Uh, so we will move to, we, so we juggled our agenda, didn't we? So we are now going to do our Appendix I conversation first. Uh, so let's have our staff report on Appendix I. All right, good afternoon. I'm Amy Nunez, Interim Director of the Office of Admissions, and I'm gonna start the uh, discussion on Appendix I. So for both RAC and the Law School Council for members of um, these associations, this will be the first time that we hear about Appendix I at this session. And so for that reason, we're going to go over um, all um, of the recommendations, staff recommendations related to Appendix I affecting the CBE, Law School Council, and RAC. So just um, as a reminder, what we, uh, how we organize the Appendix I recommendations 
were formula, they were formulated around the various licensing functions carried out by our office. And so they include all of these um, from exam analysis um, down to um, personnel. And um, what we did is also organize them um, for this session based on, um, sorry, based on the, inner, the uh, how the uh, law schools would, uh, uh, what role they would play within these functions, as well as what the board role would be. Um, we're also going to talk later about the various options and get very specific about the uh, accrediting um, options that are on, the, uh, are on the table at the moment. One of the functions that's not included in here so um, is uh, a new one that is um, not currently being carried out or carried out in a very limited fashion, and that is looking at trends in functioning, um, in, in licensing and certification, sorry. And this involves continu con continuously looking for um, uh, innovations in licensure. And the idea here is that the CBE would carry that out and report it, reporting it back to the board. So with that, let me start with um, each of the um, functioning areas. So as you will see here, this table reflects the exam development function. And within that function, we have um, six separate um, tasks that are related to that function. So they include the development of questions, the review of questions, the review and evaluation of the grading process, a sampling plan, and that is a sampling plan that determines the exam content areas for each of the bar exams, challenges to the exam questions that sometimes comes up from applicants, and also setting exam fees. With, within each of these, the proposed entity um, for, for example, development of questions is the edge team. And that is um, the method that we're um, using, employing right now for the development of uh, exam questions. And so that would be a status quo in our current structure. And in terms of um, the law school, and I won't do this for every single item, but the idea would be that the law schools would participate at, at the request of, um, for, uh, at the request and in the exam fees um, area only. So let me talk about the rest of the items. They are the review of questions, um, and that's carried out by the, by the CBE, and we pr are proposing to uh, keep that the same way we're doing it now. Review and evaluation of the grading process, the CBE carries that out, um, and we have had reviews, but um, this is um, a proposal to, to evaluate our process on a yearly basis, perhaps. The sampling plan, um, this stems from a recommendation made by um, the psychometricians during the bar exam studies to evaluate and, uh, and create a methodology for how we select content areas for the bar exam. Um, in that sense, it's new, and what we would do is um, we're proposing that staff and a psychometrician carry that out. We also have challenges to questions. Um, that uh, when that happens, it comes to the CBE, and we are proposing to keep that as it's in the same process. And lastly, setting exam fees, um, that is also um, conducted and carried out by the CBE, and we are proposing to keep that the same. As I mentioned earlier, in terms of the law school role, that we would um, seek input from um, the law schools on the exam fees only in terms of the exam development functions. And, um, there's the implication of what it would mean for the board is that um, they would review the results um, and the evaluation. As you'll see throughout this presentation, the board is, um, is, has to approve all changes, um, whether it's exam fees, whether it's proposed rules, um, or a sampling plan. Um, this is part of the evaluation that um, we were, that the Supreme Court um, uh, directed us to conduct every seven years as part of the bar exam evaluation. And so, um, so the board has a, a big role in that as well. Testing accommodation. So this is the process um, by which we carry out the, uh, or respond to the um, ADA request for a testing accommodations. There are three major components to that um, function. Um, the policy development, um, and right now, it's carried out by staff and CBE, and we are not making any changes. We're actually not proposing any changes to the process in the function of testing accommodations. Uh, when a determination is made by a staff, when we get a request, applicants can deny, uh, can um, appeal that, um, whether it's a denial, 
a partial um, denial. Um, they are uh, that's carried out by staff in in uh, consultation with our consultants, who um, are doctors that um, uh, sometimes have to uh, review some of our recommendations or we use to make decisions and uh, make a recommendation. So the proposal is for staff to continue um, carrying that out with the consultants, and that keeps us the same. Um, and also in terms of the appeal to dial, there, I jumped at that, um, is um, that would be go to the CBE. So a CBE would hear those appeals and make a determination. And like I said, that is um, not a change from our current system. The law schools um, would participate in, um, as in working groups where we would select uh, representatives in the event that we ever had a directed, specialized discussion on any perhaps like policy development um, or um, you know, suggested um, protocol changes, um, we would come to the law schools perhaps um, uh, it for um, insight on, and perspective on some of that through these working groups. And like I mentioned, in terms of the board, um, policy changes are approved by the board. Moral character. Um, for moral character, as you can see, they have uh, very similar um, life, uh, functions under moral character that testing accommodations has. That is, uh, policy development for moral character. There is a, um, a process called informal conferences. And for those of you who are um, less familiar with this, um, when a moral character application comes to the Office of Admissions, they are um, evaluated by a team of two teams. One is a pre-processing team that makes a that can clear a case or clear an application that um, doesn't have that much um, uh, that's fully compliant with all aspects of the application. When we have applications that um, have flags that raise concerns and that require more scrutiny. Some of those are um, in, uh, directed to the committee of bar examiners. They, they sometimes will call in, uh, they require more information from an applicant um, to these sessions called informal conferences. At those informal conferences, the committee can gauge and gather more information, um, perhaps questions about some of these rehabilitation as a determination whether that application should be cleared in moral character or not. Perhaps um, sometimes a uh, member could, um, one of the members could uh, recommend abeyance so that somebody um, receives um, uh, services um, or a referral to perhaps like ethics school and then um, would be reconsidered at the end of that period. So informal conferences are um, interviews that are conducted and currently they are conducted by the CBE. The proposal here is for staff to carry that out um, and um, and it mirrors the policy that we have right now with testing accommodations, as you saw previously, where the staff is really carrying out that function and the CBE would serve as the appeals body for that. So, for example, if um, we had a case that um, had an informal conference, that informal conference would be carried out by um, staff. And if um, an applicant wanted to um, appeal the um, denial of that um, in that process, denial was the outcome, the CBE would be the uh, body that would um, hear that appeal. And um, the proposal here in terms of law school participation is, um, again, to, um, in the event that we ever, it was ever required and we had a working group that was perhaps uh, proposing policy changes or seeking input about policy changes, law schools would um, uh, participate in that work and the board's um, position is the same. All right, so here, eligibility and exam rules and enforcement. This function um, have, carries the same path as, um, it goes down the same path as the, the previous ones. So policy development, again, these are rules related to um, eligibility to sit for the exam, um, eligibility um, uh, just in general. Um, I think you've heard of chapter six, and um, these are in, uh, violations during the bar exam itself. Um, so um, a cell phone bringing a cell phone into the bar exam is an example of a chapter six uh, violation. Um, and lastly, appeals. So again, it would be staff in the CBE working on the policy development aspects of, um, of this function. 
and um, staff would make the initial determination um, on what those um, sanctions would be for some of these violations. Um, you know, implementing the policies that have been established by staff and CBE. And lastly, the CBE would um, hear the appeals process. And the change here would be that the staff uh, makes that initial determination and carries that out. And once more, um, the law schools, um, these are rules that impact the law school, so most likely this would be the kind of item that would appear, for example, at a law school assembly and perhaps even on the in the periodic newsletter that you'll see soon, um, is one of the proposals as a method of engagement with um, the law schools in the state bar. Okay, exam analysis and review. So this is um, a function of um, looking, it's uh, related to the bar exam studies. As you recall, starting in 2017, the state bar began um, in investigating and exploring the bar exam itself, conducting the content validation study as well as the standard study, uh, standard setting study. We're also embarking shortly on the job analysis, and this proposal is for staff to carry this out with the staff with consultant support, and um, which does not change of how we um, how we conducted both the standard setting and the content validation. And we plan to seek input from the um, law schools by um, identifying representatives to serve on the working group that's going to carry out, for example, the job and upcoming job analysis. Budget, so in terms of budget, whether it's budget proposals or uh, monitoring, this would be carried out by staff. And um, the same process um, uh, applies to both the personnel. So that would be, um, uh, staff would be carrying out on um, personnel actions here at the state bar. I noted um, also earlier, trends in licensing and certification. This is again, um, takes a form of um, attending conferences, learning about what the current trends are um, in these arenas and coming back and reporting it, whether to the full CBE, um, perhaps even to the board, um, but learning and having our stakeholders um, that can bring back information and be part of that process. And we, yes. I, I would say though that that's not Okay. Uh, it's not because we always sent people to the national um, conference of bar examiners, and okay. that's essentially where we learn about what everybody's doing in other states, and um, and then we share that when we get back. Okay. Um, and also, um, so the way that um, the law school would be impacted is um, we would update that, update them in regular communication. And um, again, this uh, through the law school assembly, the yearly um, uh, gathering, um, some of this information could be disseminated or we could um, engage in dialogue related to that. Maintaining relationships. So I'm going to move to, um, here we talked about um, the um, methods for engaging the schools. And um, this is just an overall summary of the different um, proposed methods. So the first um, is um, a biannual um, newsletter, um, communication from the state bar to the schools. The other is an annual law school assembly, um, which is a two-way communication, and law school participation in working groups. I'm gonna get a little more specific here. Oops, okay. So, Currently, um, the modes I just described here as a recommendation are um, how we um, interface with um, the law schools now. So we have, um, obviously, you know, the work here at the um, Law School Council and Advisory Committee on California Accredited Law Schools. Um, within each of these, um, in the Law School Assembly, is a meeting that we invite all Cal California law school deans or the representatives to come and um, uh, disseminate information about the schools. So in order to uh, better understand how schools, um, law schools and the state bar um, can engage in meaningful uh, uh, dialogue, um, we sent a survey to all California law schools back in uh, July. So on July 18th, 
58 um, surveys went out to all of the California law school deans, and we heard back from 22 deans representing a 38% response rate. When we sent the survey, um, we received bounce back emails where we had the wrong email. We corrected those. We sent um, two more rounds of uh, reminders for anybody who had not responded. And um, we also made calls to the California, um, the Cal accredited law school deans to try to um, understand and um, uh, understand why um, people weren't participating or to address Elaine and fears about participation. Um, and nonetheless, we ended up with a 38% response rate. Now, um, as you can see here, one of the questions that appeared on the survey um, asked about um, both um, all three, law school assembly, law school council, and RAC, and um, whether people found that, how valuable people found that. If you look at the categories of usually valuable and consistently valuable, for the most part of roughly 40, around, uh, covering over 30%, uh, yeah, sorry, 40%, um, most deans found um, these outlets um, valuable. So for example, law school assembly, 43% of deans across all school types found um, that um, law school assembly was either usually or consistently valuable. 37% um, rated the law school council as usually or consistently valuable. And 43% of um, deans or across um, school types believe that um, RAC was usually or consistently valuable. So what we wanted to do is, um, as at the state bars, also gauge um, law school dean attendance and agendas. Uh, so we looked at agendas and minutes to, um, to gauge that. Because what we're trying to do is identify how um, we can achieve meaningful engagement Part of that is knowing who's coming to the meetings and, um, and to determine the level of engagement as well. So we looked at um, the agendas from 2016 to present, and what we discovered, sorry, was that um, in 2016, 17, and 18, 2017 represented the highest attendance of, in all of these three forums. And so what we discovered is that um, for law school council, 26% um, of ABA deans came to at least one meeting in 2017. For Cal deans, at least 53% um, came to at least one meeting that year, and 20% of um, unaccredited or registered law schools had at least one dean attend. I mean, attended at least one um, law school council meeting. As for BRAC, um, yeah, no ABA deans attended, and that makes perfect sense. But 75% um, of um, Cal deans attended at least one meeting, and 10% of registered um, law school deans attended at least one BRAC meeting. Um, the other item that we looked at to gauge meaningful participation is the agenda items that appeared um, on BRAC, on the law school council, and on the um, uh, CBE to look at um, how often there was uh, multiple instances of the same agenda item. And that did happen often. And, um, and given that the same attendees came to the law school council, that came to the um, BRAC meeting, that came to the state CBE meeting, rather than having meaningful engagement, at times it created a redundancy in that discussion rather than um, you know, uh, an enhanced conversation. Also, um, one thing that's not noted here is that maintaining volunteer interest for um, these committees has been a challenge. Um, you know, law school councils had a challenging time electing representatives that remain engaged on the committee. We've had deans selected on the committee that have never made it to a, a meeting. So the other item we asked about was how useful somebody would find uh, the the use of a, a, an e-newsletter from the state bar. Uh, and we asked it on a scaled question where one is not useful and five is very useful. And as you can see here, there are two metrics that we're looking at. So one is the average score. So on average, what did most deeds think it was? They rated it as a 3.7, so almost a four. So, um, so there's some use um, or they would find some use in an e-newsletter. 
Also, we asked about um, the rating of very useful. Like, I just pulled out the very useful. Um, anybody who classified that as very useful, across the board, it's about 32%. With the registered uh, teams um, identifying it as 50% uh, of them uh, categorizing it as very useful. In terms of annual meetings, again, this is an annual meeting of all law school deans, resembling the law school assembly that we have right now. The average score of how useful that would be is 3.7 across the board. And in terms of uh, the very useful classification, 27% on average of deans across the board um, find that a, an annual meeting would be very useful. In terms of um, the use of a task force or working group, and this is um, one that would um, you know, work on a focused um, uh, topic, um, the reading was, again, the average across um, all dean types would be three, is a 3.7. Um, and in terms of very useful, 36% of deans across the board um, rated that, uh, the use of a, work, uh, of a task force or working group as very useful. So, in terms of um, identifying other suggestions, perhaps there's something that we did not include in the survey, or perhaps um, uh, you know that we needed another mode of identifying something that would be um, help, another suggestion on meaningful engagement. We weren't able to identify, but I do want to um, note that a lot of the deans that I spoke with wanted to point out the fact that. The law school assembly um, grants opportunities for deans to meet one another and provide a forum, a forum that doesn't exist in other arenas. So I just want to highlight that. So given what we want to achieve at the state bar, and that is um, a forum to engage law schools and deans, um, it's critical that the modalities that we identify allow as much participation from all California legal education institutions whether Cal, unaccredited, or ABA, as possible. So the data that we presented support some of these, um, uh, these recommendations. So first, the um, annual convening of all, of all law schools. So uh, I noted that we had a law school assembly, and the data that dispels that people are interested in uh, maintaining that. The other is the participation on working groups with a defined scope, duration, and charge. and. Um, and that is what we are proposing here. And lastly is the e-newsletter to be periodically disseminated. And it would include um, policy information or updates as we learn about them um, as a way of um, uh, engaging the law schools. And um, that's it. Okay. Now we are going to talk about accreditation. I certainly agree. Shall we? Uh, let me remind you. So we're going to we're take a moment now to take public comment and presentation regarding law school interaction and engagement that we've just had from the staff. Uh, let me start with Dean Palazzolo. Is your comment concerning that area? It is. Okay. Please proceed for about two minutes. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, I know a few schools have already commented on Appendix I in connection with the CBE Programs Committee. I concur with those comments, but I direct my comments today specifically to this RAC issue. RAC gives the law schools an opportunity to initiate as well as comment on new rules and guidelines. The State Bar proposes replacing the RAC with working groups, but there is no mechanism for the law schools to request a working group and no requirement for staff to convene such a group on law school requests. So I'm concerned that the law schools are going to lose their voices entirely in terms of being able to consider and comment on proposed rules and guidelines other than as regular members of the public, which may be reduced to a minute or two at a public meeting. Secondly, I have a concern about diverting all decisions, both rules and implementation, strictly to staff. This is particularly so where there is no mechanism for disclosing potential conflicts of interest where there is essentially one staff member dealing with school applications for major changes and a tendency for the CBE to take staff recommendations 
if a conflict arose with that single staff member, we don't really have a mechanism for a workaround. There is no rack to review and revise a guideline that may be interpreted loosely or wrongly by staff. It is disconcerting that the state bar may be making decisions based upon input from ABA teams who have no reason to interact with the rack. Concerns about cost and composition may well need to be addressed, but that's a very different approach than a wholesale elimination of the Cal Soul opportunity to meaningfully engage in the regulatory process. Now, I heard just now a statistic that 75% of the cows participate in the RAC. It's obviously important to us. And let's not throw out the RAC because the law school council may be considered redundant. I'd request a revision rather than an elimination of the RAC. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dean Palazzolo. While we're on the line, is there any other member of the public on the phone uh, who wants to make a public comment at this time on this issue? Okay, hearing none, let's turn to public comment in the room on this issue of uh, engagement with the law school. Hearing none. Uh, so hearing none, we'll close the public comment on this issue and proceed to discussion. And Erica, it looks like uh, uh, Dean Klopfenberg wants to make a comment, so let me turn it over to you to conduct the portion of that discussion that pertains to the law school council discussion at the moment. Thank you, Erica. Actually, could you spell your last name? Sure, K-L-O-P-P-E-N-B-E-R-G, Santa Clara University. So um, I, as I'm almost done my term on the law school council, this will be my last meeting. Uh, but I do think it's distressing that we didn't see Appendix I before on the phone where most of the deans are present, including several members of the law school council. It's being read to them. They don't have it in front of them. And as I understand it, you didn't say it to me, but my understanding is basically there the proposal is to eliminate the law school council and RAC, right, okay. So I think we can all agree that meaningful engagement is good, and I just question whether the elimination of that is the way to achieve it. We, with Mitch as chair, we had worked very hard over the last year, year and a half, to make, to provide for more meaningful engagement with, by sending representatives, by working on specific topics. It just feels frustrating that we never had the chance to try that. You know, um, and, and this may be useful, it may be easier for people, um, but I don't think it's really going to um, foster the kind of relationships we want. You know, seeing each other regularly, being in the same room is an important part of, of really um, having dialogue. Information is different than dialogue, and this feels like a lot. Even the way today is being handled, it feels like information being given to us on a one-way street. Yeah, so I concur with the comments of Dean Kloppenberg as well as Dean Palazzotto about um, the decision or recommendation to disband both the law school council and RAC. I've had the pleasure for these past four years and certainly the last three years to work on both of those committees and I have found that the, the more you engage directly on policy issues and language issues, the more you get to understand exactly what is going on. It is, I, and I think it has, over the course of my tenure here, I think the communications have improved for the people that attend. And I think the, I, I've certainly personally learned a lot more about the law schools because of my role in actively being here at every meeting present. And I, I was, with all due respect to the recommendations and the people that recommended it, the idea that we're going to just replace that with working groups and newsletters um, is certainly, they are not the replacement. The communications will be worse. Transparency will disappear. And, um, and this is going to be consistent with my, you know, my concerns when I, uh, about the rest of the stuff. But I think that this is something I think that if and we take at face value that the state bar values improved communication. I think that's what they need to focus on. And getting rid of the best means to do that does not accomplish 
the intended purpose. Uh, I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I concur with each of the, uh, I concur with each of the uh, three prior comments and So I concur with each of the uh, three prior comments, and, anyway, and I look at the number of deans reporting, there were only nine of the 21 ABA deans and five of the 15 Cal Bar accredited deans, and I don't know, I, I don't believe I responded, and I don't recall receiving a telephone call, and I may have seen the email, and but I, so I know I didn't respond. I know how I would have responded, I would have responded positively uh, for retaining both the law school council as well as as the RAC. Um, and um, I was the director for examinations with the State Bar of California when the RAC was established. And the reason why it was established was to foster better communication between law schools and uh, the, the, the State Bar staff. And I have found it to be wildly successful, and it is so much better for the students uh, and the the, uh, the law schools, uh, and it has uh, been uh, prior to the establishment of the RAC, there was not the avenue for communication and to develop uh, uh, new rules or change new rules or retain rules, and I think that the RAC has provided uh, that and it, it, it's far surpassed anything that we were involved in when I was working with the State Bar on the Committee of Bar Examiners establishing the RAC. It has been much more successful than we have even intended or anticipated. I also had a couple of comments about the exams and moral character, but should I re reserve those for, for later? So let me say, those were part of this presentation and uh, Let's take any other comments on, on the engagement mechanisms for a moment and then come back to them. But yeah, before we move on to the next segment, let's make sure we get those in. And maybe uh, Erica, I think. Yeah, you're... I just had something, I had a question, and that was uh, in the survey, was there any area that the deans had the opportunity to explain why they felt the group was unsuccessful or less successful? And uh, what was the consensus as to why the group, why each group was not um, useful, I'm sorry, useful? Okay, I, I don't have that data in front of me, but um, mm -hmm. uh, let me just also um, reframe your question. It sounds like you were asking if there was room to um, add um, language um, that um, supported their, the rating, whether it was about law school engagement and, um, and that did happen, there was room in, in some of these questions, but I, I did not summarize that, but I, I know that it was, um, so you got to rate it, and if you had an, you know, wanted to add additional items, there was an open-ended item, that did not get filled out that often, but um, if you wanted that data, I could supply it. I just, I think it would be helpful to know why they felt it was not helpful or useful. Um, it could be, it's just, a bad time to offer it, or you know, there could be different reasons why. So, so that would be helpful. Well, um, there were general comments. I do have to, I do recall these um, about um, the ability for schools to be able to um, commit to the time that it takes to for travel um, and to participate. Um, that was one of the comments that surfaced, as well as the. Um, sorry, there was one. Right, that's what um, the one said. And the concern I have with that is that's just a physical transportation issue. It's not a content issue. It's not saying, yes, I attended these meetings and they were dumb, you know, or, or we didn't accomplish anything. And it was, and in that sense, it was not useful. So uh, I think unless you have comments that are, that are speaking to the content of those groups, uh, it's, it's not really a fair way to measure if somebody thinks it's helpful or not. Um, and I would also ask for the law school newsletter, um, would there be an opportunity for the deans to contribute articles? 
Yes, I was just going to turn to our members of the Law School Council, and uh, uh, Joanna has the board liaison, of course you can make a comment. Please, and then we'll come back to the room. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things that I mentioned at the program committee uh, meeting on Friday, so I know a couple of you have already heard this, but um, you know, we uh, have received a letter from the legislature that specifically raises concerns regarding um, the scope of involvement of the dean in their own regulation of law schools and the antitrust issues that arise from that. There's this appearance, whether or not it's true, I'm not making a comment on, but there is apparently an appearance that the, the regulated is driving, are driving the regulation. Uh, which is, you know, a concern we have to be extremely sensitive to going forward, considering that it came from one of our oversight bodies. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is these bodies were created before Bagley Keene was imposed on the bar and we started following the open meeting laws. Think the transparency has changed significantly and it's improving all the time. Um, I heard a concern that I thought might be a valid one, and that's the one about the dean not being able to request a working group on something. It seems to me that that would be something the committee of bar examiners should be open to allowing public comment be made on. But just it, it's up to it's up to the chair of the committee of bar examiners to allow public comment on certain items. And it seems to me to provide the deans an opportunity to say, we would like a working group on this, make that argument in front of the committee and bar examiners. That's something we should try and find a way to make happen. Uh, you know, besides if some other regulation is already being presented through staff. I would like to see the deans all receive the agenda for the committee of bar examiners going forward proactively so they're aware of what's coming up. But oh, I just want everyone to be sensitive to the concern raised by the legislature going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. And uh, are there other members of the Law School Council on the line? Uh, well, actually, let me look. Is there anybody else who can? Uh, uh, Dean Strauss? Looks like Dean Johnson and Strauss are the other two. Yeah, who are. Uh, uh, so, uh, any of any of the other members wish to make a comment? Not on these issues. For me. Okay, so back to the room then. I think uh, uh, member. Let's we'll, we'll take Jackie and then we'll take. Uh, uh, so I, first, just to have it on the record, I concur with the comments of, of everyone who has spoken about what I think of as a very valuable resource, both the Law School Council and the Rules Advisory Committee. And my concern about the replacement of them with working groups, I think one of the things that's really helpful about both of these that there, is that they're standing committees. Um, and although Bagley Keen does put some additional procedural um, burdens on them, I'm not sure that's a basis for uh, disbanding them. Uh, and the, as I understand it, the statute was passed in order to increase transparency and openness. Uh, that's a good thing and, and hopefully something we're trying to facilitate here. So I hope we're not going to be using that particular statute as, a, as one of the reasons to eliminate it. Um, I, I think being able to propose a working group to the CBE and perhaps have the CBE vote on it and give an okay. Is, is an option, although I don't think it is as a positive as having a formal standing committee that the deans know exist um, and that meetings will occur. And uh, in, for that reason, I'm, I'm in favor of, of keeping um, both both of the uh, law school council and the rules advisory committee. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I want to agree in part with, with things that everybody was saying um, earlier um, because the goal of what we're proposing here 
is increased engagement, increased meaningful engagement, increased transparency, um, having sort of better opportunities to have discussions with uh, the law school deans as appropriate. And so to the extent that that sort of this proposal is seeming to go in the opposite direction, then you know, I would certainly agree with, with you because of that, what we're trying to do is actually increase engagement. Um, so, so one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of struggling through here is, um, because we, we have in fact, and Amy's, Amy talked about some of this, found that, that some of the, the agendas um, uh, have been redundant and not just because it's um, an advisory committee making a recommendation to CBE the next day, so of course it would be redundant in that instance. Um, but there has been some redundancy um, in um, in what what we've been talking about at the meetings, and and that doesn't seem just sort of rehashing the same having the same conversation with law school council followed by RAC, followed by CBE. That's not meaningful engagement, and so so I'm struggling with you know what it, you know are there options other than what the state bar rec staff recommendations were and keeping things as they are now, right? Maybe part of it is structure. Um, I, I know I sort of have a, sort of a personal um, uh, resistance to the back-to-back -back meetings, um, and, and that tends to feel more, um, uh, more redundant. Um, and so maybe part of it is a structural issue. Uh, you know, are there ways to do it differently? Are there ways to have a group, have one committee as opposed to two committees that um, will have the right information that will draw the ABA deans to participate, but also you know provide the appropriate forum for um, for the the Cal accredited or the, the um, unaccredited schools. Um, so you know what are the other opportunities? And it was one of the questions that we'd asked in the survey was whether that there, whether there were suggestions for some more um, other suggestions for meaningful engagement. We really didn't get much of a response on that, and I would really love to hear sort of some thoughts, whether in the room or um, you know a follow-up email uh, to me, just sort of letting me know what those thoughts are, because I'd really like to have an option sort of other than status quo and what the staff recommendation is. Erica? I just wanted to comment on, as far as redundancy goes, within one group, if they repeat their agenda and have continuing conversation, it's usually because it's such an important topic and there's been so much dialogue that it won't fit all in one meeting. So I wouldn't gauge redundancy in an in a agenda as this is rehashing stuff and it's, um, it's not helpful. Uh, in the same way, when you look at the different groups, whether it's RAC, um, CBE, law school council, if they're all discussing the same issue in their groups, they're doing so because that's their allotted time. You're, you would be eliminating their allotted time because in the CBE meeting, um, it looks like they're all gonna be one day meetings now. There's not time for all the stakeholders to jump in and offer their comments without the meeting going much longer or it having to be tabled and moved to the next meeting. So it's actually a lot more efficient when you have a separate group of just deans, for example, uh, to discuss an important issue, come up with this is what we think is best, and then they can suggest that to CBE. That seems to me to be just more efficient. <coughs> Okay, well, I have, I have a couple of thoughts to uh, contribute as well. Uh, one is to address this antitrust comment uh, that was remind, we were reminded of. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to make sure that everybody, and uh, that, that includes the folks who might be watching this in video, and I hope it gets right in front of every single board member, that the uh, State Bar of California has already ruled on this, uh, in a January opinion by the Office of General Counsel. Uh, that opinion was repeated when the matter was raised again by another individual later uh, with another opinion uh, providing, provided on this antitrust question. That matter was then filed with the Supreme Court 
in a petition on exact, including this issue, including many other issues in this issue, and summarily denied by the United by the California Supreme Court. So this question of antitrust has been thoroughly examined and completely rejected in every form where it's been addressed. And uh, I, I'm not sure how it came to be that a member of the legislature became interested in this matter. Uh, certainly, I appreciate the difficult position that puts the bar into and the board into. Uh, and certainly have my commitment to do anything I can to help with it, but uh, it's pretty easy to <laughs> find that this has been more than thoroughly uh, addressed and concluded. And so I don't think that uh, that should any longer be any part of, of the decision about whether to retain uh, the, this, this very, in my opinion, very important mechanism for appropriately vetting through those who are regulated the rules that will apply uh, to the schools going forward. Um, so I'd like to set that one aside, and I, uh, Joanna, I appreciate the importance of the sensitivity of the context, and so I don't mean to diminish that in the least, but I want to make sure that it's clear and on the record that that's been thoroughly decided from a legal standpoint. There's not, a, there's not an actual concern there any longer from a legal standpoint. Uh, so far as all the competent authorities, including the Supreme Court of California, are concerned. Um, that there is no such thing. So uh, then I would like to ask a couple of questions. Actually, Amy, I don't know if it's possible to put the law school survey data back up sure. for us, if, if you could. And I'm particularly interested in the, the I really need to ask the, the staff a question about the reason for recommending abolishing uh, the highest scoring item in the whole list, which is the Rules Advisory Committee. That slide shows uh, that 43% of the total and 60% of the CALs and 63% of the registered schools all considered that to be usually or consistently valuable. Um, and I don't think there's any number higher than that anywhere in this. And most of the alternative mechanisms that are being proposed, uh, if I, my notes are correct, they're right in the 20s and low 30s, 27% on the annual meetings, 32% on the newsletter. Uh, so the feedback that was actually received in the survey does not coincide with the recommendation. If you're making a data-driven decision, it would seem that the, the survey would prove that you should retain the Rules Advisory Committee. Well, um, so the, the proposal wasn't didn't stem entirely from just this data. Um, we wanted to also get a sense of attendance, which is why we also resorted to looking at um, agendas. Despite the fact that we asked about attendance um, in the survey, we thought the survey would still would lose accuracy in terms of attendance, which is why we resorted to both the minutes and the agendas to make that determination. So the, um, both the proposal um, to eliminate is really comes from a combination of um, sources. So the survey is just one of them. Okay, all right. Well, again, as, I, as we are making a kind of a public record here, I think it's important that those who might be watching, including, I hope, members of the board, would recognize that the data, in fact, does not support that recommendation. And I recognize that there may be other considerations driving the recommendation that was made, but uh, I don't see anything as scores as highly on this, on this survey. Um, there are other aspects of it, of course, that might be value or have some degree of value that were included and were considered, but uh, it just seemed a, an extreme oddity to me uh, that it uh, turned out the way it did, uh, although, it, of course, it makes sense, um, as you say. Now, uh, let me also um, ask about uh, the law school role in exam development, um, and that was an earlier slide. Um, Law school on exam development, if I remember, was uh, to, let's see, only on fees for the exam. That, is that right? Only on fees for the exam. Yes. And, um, so here's the question. Uh, so if the uh, state bar decided, and I guess it, in this case it would be the staff, or who would make the decision to, for example, change the scope of the bar exam 
to include other subjects or take subjects off or include a new type of testing? Who, who would, under the structure, would actually make that decision? Well, it, um, that would not be considered in, as an exam development function. Okay. So if it stemmed, for example, from a, um, a recommendation from a report, it would follow this path. Let's yep. see here with, for example, the um, standard setting study that looked at the cut score that came to um, the law schools. Um, and the proposal is um, through representation on this working group. So there would be a working group and there would be law school representatives engaged at any time there was a decision to change the scope of the bar exam? Yes. Okay. That's obviously one of the concerns that folks have about these structures is that they provide a formal mechanism for ensuring that big things don't happen. And I think the history of the law school council is in fact <laughs> that the state bar changed the bar exam and didn't tell the law schools. And so that's how it came into being, as I understand the history. So it's very, very important that it is a would establish a working group and would involve the law schools, not a may. Yes. That's critical. Well, and I also want to point out that this wouldn't be the only mechanism. I mean, um, if it appeared on a CBE agenda, I think um, we've noted, if we do it now, we send the um, agendas to the dean um, when the CBE agenda is ready. And so, um, and I imagine that with a decision as big as changing any aspect of the bar exam, we would have a, a comment period of that um, where um, teams would also be invited. Great, can I ask a question on that? This, this comment about what seems to be um, moving core functions of these two, council and RAP, to the working group. I mean, if I were to hear that, it seems like what it is is an attempt to um, and I think Joanna said this well. We've got Bagley King. And I just don't think that's a good idea. Uh, I don't think that's what the legislature intended in compelling that all of our work be conducted under Bagley King. I think working groups should be on, frankly, an emergency basis, really focused, short term, not these long processes that are essentially taking away significant decision making process from something that we can't see, something that people don't speak out in public on, and is behind closed doors. As I said again, this is completely opposite of what the stated objective is. And I think it's opposite of what the legislature intended to. So. Yeah, I'll just add, as a member of the hate, now apparently hated task force on emissions regulation and reform, uh, that that process was conducted entirely in the public eye. Uh, every one of those meetings was a public hearing. Uh, every one of them, as I recall, was transcribed, and those transcripts are available. And uh, at the end of that was reached a consensus view that had broad support. And then, of course, everything went to pieces in the state bar not too long after that. And it became uh, a time of great change and, and other challenges. But. Indeed, uh, that was a very successful process, and it was critical that it be done in the public eye because it affected so many different pieces of the admissions process. And uh, you know, let's never forget that admissions fundamentally affects uh, the access to justice in the state. It's about who the lawyers are, what it cost them to get a legal education, what they're capable of doing. Uh, there's 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 a very close and important connection between the one function and the other. And so anything that has the effect of closing that process down, uh, I, you know, got to give you the practical advice, it's just going to end up being more trouble than it's worth when you close those things down. Um, so that's, uh, that's my piece on, on the engagement process. Are there any other comments? Just really quickly, I'm sorry, Mark uh, as far as the legislature goes and their concerns about uh, the antitrust, isn't it the legislature that determines their own salary? And they they do a lot of, no? They have a, uh, it's a citizen's commission. Okay. Um, they don't vote, they don't have any say in, in any of that, uh, because it seems like they have rules that they govern by as well that they're not asking a, a, a 
state worker or a, a federal worker to be determining these things. So uh, it's different when there's a public group that's meeting for a certain pro uh, purpose, but um, I, I would just make that observation. And there was another comment, I thought. Pardon? I was going to make a comment on another slide. Okay. And this the one preceding this one? Uh, no, yeah, I'm sorry, it was maybe it was the one following it. Moral character. Well, I do have a comment on moral character. Um, on item number two there, um, reviews and informal conferences, um, I think I have very strong feelings about this, about the important role that the Committee of Bar Examiners plays in the informal conference proceedings. Um, uh, I served for 10 years as a director for examinations with the State Bar, but within those two years, um, uh, within those 10 years, I served almost three years as the interim director of moral character determinations. And during that process, uh, I oversaw the informal conference process. And I was a staff person, and we would convene members of the Committee of Bar Examiners to conduct the informal conferences. And I often went in with an opinion about this individual, about whether or not I felt this person had the requisite moral character to be a lawyer. Well, I often, the committee often, or the recommendation from the subgroup to the committee was often different from that. And I acknowledge that I, the staff person, was wrong. The committee, or uh, the recommendations coming out of the informal conference were from a wide variety and very diverse group of views, professionally and socially, and that was very helpful. Um, and to have a staff person making recommendations following the informal conference to the committee is too narrow. I believe you need, that's why the committee is there and why the committee is as broad as it is with public as well as attorney members. Uh, we have medical doctors, engineers, accountants, as well as lawyers, teachers, and all of those different points of views were very, very helpful in making a recommendation to the Committee of Bar Examiners about a particular individual's competence in the moral character capacity to be a lawyer. And I think having that, which is proposed, to take that informal conference process away from the committee and direct it to staff would be a terrible mistake. Great, can I speak on that too? Yes. Um, and I served on, uh, I had the pleasure the first two years to serve on moral character, and I can tell you, like uh, Dean, Dean just said, a lot of times you read the reports and you have, before you actually heard the questions and answers, you have a preconceived idea if it's just one person. The collective wisdom of listening to how they respond, people asking questions, and then the deliberations, I think does produce, produce the most, the fairest result for the benefit of the applicant. And I, I have, and I have read carefully the, the staff's recommendations and the rationale. And what I hear is it's not reliable. Well, it's not reliable based on what. It's not the idea is we get different results for the same same issues. No, you don't. These are individuals, and every one of them come to that conference with their own specific issues. And. We collectively are enlightened as whether we will pass or whether there's going to be some conditions where they have to do some other things or whether we're going to deny. And we do that, we've done that with our very best intentions. This committee, I've not heard anybody say any one of the committee members has been cavalier about that. Everyone knows that that license is at stake and people take that position very seriously. And to have it go where there's not going to be the involvement of public members and lawyer members that we don't get paid for this. We don't, we're not, our paycheck does not depend on whether we decide today we're going to pass everybody because it's expedient. 
or not, I think taking that away, I think is worse for the applicants. I don't think it enhances public protection. I think it's going to be a problem if, our, if one of our efforts is diversity. I do think it'll be more efficient. There have been many things in history that are incredibly efficient, but I don't think it's going to get the right result to determine whether this person, this particular person, has sufficient moral character to be a member of the state. Other uh, comments from the members? Let me go back to the phone just a second on this issue. Any follow-up, Joanna, particularly, you might want to react to something I said? No, I'm going to deal with you personally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? He said ominously. <laughs> I, I did have one other comment on the, on the exams. Uh, I think there was, can you hang one second? I think there was someone else speaking. On the line? Yes, Robert, yes, Robert Strauss. I'll chime in after the other person speaks. Okay, all right. So I think he's moving to a different subject, though. Okay. Exam development? Well, I want to speak on exam development. Oh, perfect. Go ahead. Yeah, so me or Robert? Uh, let's have Dean Barbieri first and then Dean Strauss. Um, my comments, uh, it's really more of a question on item number four, which is sampling plan to determine exam content areas, staff and psychometrician, which is a new process in the, from the current structure, and I just don't know what that means. Oh, okay. I can clarify that. So um, I mentioned that um, this recommendation stems from a recommendation made by um, this, uh, multiple psychometricians that we worked with um, during the content validation, um, the content um, study and the validation study, uh, standard study, sorry about that. And, um, and what it is is currently we track um, the content areas that are covered from one bar exam to the next. The idea is to employ a methodology so that there is more of a control of um, what, uh, gets, what appears on the next. Um, uh, exam study, exam in terms of uh, determining the content areas. So um, it's employing a methodology rather than just a tracking mechanism that we do now. Okay, thank you. Um, so when I was the director for examinations, um, one of the goals was always to keep the applicants guessing as to what the topics would be. And uh, the bar review companies would regularly predict what would the next topic is going to be on the on the upcoming bar examination. Not just evidence, but specific areas within the evidence uh, arena. And consequently, people would, would plan in reliance on the predictions from Barbary and Kaplan and Themis and whomever it might have been and under the circumstances. My goal was always, when I was working with the EDGE team to select questions, to be what I considered predictably unpredictable. And um, I question, my question really would be how the psychometricians, I would hate to see it be too me mechanical. One of the big reasons is you're limited by the questions that are in the banks. And you give a question that's been developed over a number of years. And um, I think doing sampling is fine, but I just my caution would be some sort of area where you're set, getting into an area where you will be predictable, which is going to then change the way people study for the examinations. And, um, my experience in looking at all the exams since I've left the State Bar uh, to see the different questions that have been selected, I've been very impressed with the, the variety of questions and it would be difficult under the current situation for me to conclude that the subject matter or the topics being tested on the bar examination are predictable as, as they are. And I don't think the intent is um 
um, to make it predictable. I think it's just to have some control over a method of it. It's embraced um, for determining the content areas. And it's a process that um, other bar jurisdictions use too. So I think it's conforming with um, principles adopted in other bar jurisdictions too. All right, Dean Strauss, thank you for your patience. You're welcome. Uh, my question has to do with evaluating exams. Currently, the deans of various law schools are invited to calibration sessions uh, to review the grading of the bar exam. It was the proposal to eliminate that process? No, uh, that's not in the proposal. We would continue with dean participation at calibration. Public, um, public protection. Okay. Well, I, I'm confused because I would see that under exam development and the evaluation of grading. But the original presentation indicated that the role of law schools was only with regard to setting exam fees. So are there other current roles for law schools that aren't listed on this? Document no, and we can um, change that also on this chart. So we can um, spec uh, specify that um, because um, that um, is embedded within that uh, item three, which is a review and evaluation of the grading process. But we don't have a recommendation to change that or to change dean participation. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to call that the last of uh, this item. We have another big part of this item to address ahead of us. Um, be before I go from that, uh, this is an item that's on our agenda. The only power of the RAC is to make suggestions or recommendations to the Committee of Bar Examiners. So just before we move on, are there any uh, motions or ideas about making a recommendation to the Committee of Bar Examiners regarding this portion of Appendix I. I think we should vote it down. I think we should reject the proposal. I would make that motion. I don't think they've made their case. Is there a second? Second. And so uh, let's be specific about the motion. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, there, there is potential. Yes, got to be specific. So the sidebar is about process on whether we should discuss this at this stage on this portion uh, or overall at the very end. And uh, the, so I don't know which the which is the right answer there. It's a complicated process and it would be difficult. We do it now. We do it now because we just finished discussing the, the right. While we're fresh so, on it, and, so we're, and, I, and, and my motion would be to reject the changes and I'll focus on the elimination of the law school council and the rules advisory committee. I would also specifically include in that the proposed change to renew, remove the committee from their role as uh, participants in the informal conferences. All right, so with that revision, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Barbieri. Uh, is there uh, further discussion by the members of the RAC? Because <laughs> we're only running the RAC at this moment. We're running both, but this part of the conversation That's our job. is That's our job to make this. a motion on the RAC, on the floor of the RAC. So, Greg, just to clarify, um, if we're a member of the Law School Council, not RAC, are we allowed to vote on this? Not motion? on this issue. Not on this motion. This Even though motion. It, it takes elimination of law school counsel. And we will right. hand that over to, uh, we just got to follow the rules on meetings. I, I'm going to hand that over to, whoever, to Derek, who's I think chairing the law school council, mm -hmm. for a parallel process in just a moment. All right? And so at the moment where this is just a motion in rack, and Jackie has come. Just, I, I want to make sure I understand. Karen's motion was specific to the Rules Advisory Committee. 
and did not involve the law school council? No, it's, a it's a recommendation. We're, as, as, as a RAC body, we are able to make a recommendation in response to this proposal. So it included um, a rejection, a proposed re the rejection of the proposal to eliminate both law school council and the rules advisory. And that's coming from our, our group as RAC. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So, motion, any further discussion? We don't have any members on the phone. Everybody in RAC is here in the room, is present in the room. Uh, further discussion? Okay, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, say aye. Oh, can you nope. do this by roll call? Oh, we have to do roll call. We've got to do roll call. Yeah. David, can you call the roll of RAC on this vote? Okay. Barbara Aray? Aye. Brandis? Aye. Ardina? Aye. Goodman? Aye. Fairmontson? Aye. Lynn? Aye. So okay, the so record should reflect that that's unanimous. That it's important to reflect that the uh, the motion passed passed unanimously. Uh, let's suspend the rack for a moment so the law school council can do its business. And do oh, do we have further discussion from any of the law school council members? You probably need a motion in from by someone right. in the law school council first, right? Right. I expect. So I move. Um, to have a parallel motion to reject the proposals regarding RAC and L and law school council. I'll second that. The, I think, wasn't there also a motion in here uh, regarding moral character? Yes, so if we could have, um, just copy Karen's language, mm -hmm. so it would also uh, leave it with the multi-person committee. The, the, the committee of our Right. I'll second that motion. Okay, any discussion by the members? Um, yes. yes. Karen Goodman, part of the law school council. I am. Yes. Oh, you are? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, keeping, I'm just paying attention. I'm looking at it right here. For one, for maybe one half hour more, I'm still a member of this this committee. Timely, as it may be. You know, well, it's wonderful. I just wanted to make sure it went through the I was, I was, yeah. Don't worry, she's on your side. <laughs> this time. <laughs> Uh, so then, uh, yes. this is Joanna. I just um, I will be abstaining simply because I'm on the line more to get to hear everyone's thoughts on this. I don't think it's appropriate for me to be taking a position from something that is going to be coming to the board after we've gotten input from everybody. So I just wanted to explain my opinion. Okay, thank you. So we have Mendoza abstaining. Can we, yes, can we uh, have a roll call on the Yes. Uh, Johnson. He dropped he the Aye. Strauss. Prager was on the line. Aye. I thought Prager was on the line. I can't remember. Goodman. Aye. Miramatsu. Aye. Lynn? Aye. And Mendoza is abstained. And Craker okay. was also on the line. Technically. Oh, you, okay. Um, and that, since it wasn't noticed, um, she can't. I can't vote. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Just so it should reflect the past. Okay. That would be for our good side, not me. Sorry. Wait, say it past. Oh, yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Well, one abstention. With one abstention. Thank you. And uh, for the record, just a uh, quorum check, all members of the RAC were present uh, sufficiently for a quorum for the law school council. I don't know if that's been noted on the record or not. And, and Greg, does that have to be for the vote? Because In order to yeah. vote, there has yes. to be a quorum. Yes. There's a quorum. Yes. Just making sure it's on the, on the record. All right, so now, uh, make sure this is still on. Now we turn to the other parts of uh, the uh, appendix IIM. Uh, 
And I'll just let folks know at this time, we, we do, I do expect we'll be running over uh, our appointed end time for today. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm Natalie Leonard, the Program Manager for Educational Standards and Legal Specialization uh, here at the Bar, and we'll be talking about law school accreditation options. Um, so the Bar has been thinking about a lot of different things, about uh, what is the purpose of accreditation, uh, how is it that it's being measured, and what are different ways uh, that it can be carried out in the unique uh, way that it, it is carried out um, here in California. It has been for a long time. So uh, we started with two proposals, and we're finding that this may actually be growing. Um, and, uh, but I'll start with those two original uh, proposals. One option is an in-house staff-led proposal. Uh, so using the rules and guidelines of today um, that are promulgated by the CBE and the Board of Trustees, I'm having the day-to-day -day functions carried out by staff. So how that would differ from the current proposal um, is that uh, decisions that are normally prepared with the help of staff and brought to the CBE that are often ministerial, uh, so, so for example, simple compliance with rules or evaluating a move uh, from one location to another, uh, would be handled by staff with the schools having the option to bring an appeal to the CBE um, at their election. Okay, um, a second option would involve outsourcing to WASC um, which is a regional accreditor, and uh, those two are different in their focus. So the State Bar is a professional accreditor. It's focused on a specific degree program. Here, that's the JD program. A WASC is an institutional accreditor. It accredits the entire institution across all JD programs, I'm sorry, apologize, across all programs, um, no matter the area or content. It's looking at student learning outcomes, how those outcomes are measured, and how that's assessed for a cycle of continuous improvement. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, the State Bar would need to be able to create a bridge in that case, because in order to become eligible for WASC accreditation, a, a school must have at least six students and be a going concern, so there would need to be an avenue for, um, for a new schools to begin, and for current schools that are not WASC accredited to transition to that status. Many of the schools are actually already familiar with WASC. Of the 15 Cal accredited schools, at this point, six are WASC accredited, and three are in the process or considering uh, WASC accreditation right now. <coughs> I also want to bring uh, to the attention of the group several other proposals that have been suggested. One could be a hybrid model uh, where there might be options for schools to consider a Cal accreditation. Um, or a WASP accreditation. Uh, so that's something in the early stages of serious consideration. Um, a second option discussed only very recently uh, was, in a sense, a back to the future option. Uh, for those history buffs in, uh, in the audience, you might remember uh, back in the 30s and 40s, there was a time when accreditation was simply based on one number, a pass number, and that was a bar passage of 60%. Uh, so one thing that, that was proposed here was a more slimmed down version of accreditation in which uh, bar passage would be considered along with employment outcomes um, and customer or consumer satisfaction where the customer is the student because there are some students that would attend a CALS or an unaccredited not solely to earn a bar license but maybe for other purposes um, in their careers. So those are the three options that were considered we went through uh, the details of WASP accreditation and what that means in great detail with the Programs Committee on Friday, but we've come to learn that there is a really high familiarity with that body here, so it might be more productive to um, open the floor to uh, public and committee comment and questions at this time. So uh, let's uh, uh, make sure that um, we're focused on the accreditation and our comments. Uh, let's uh, open the floor to the folks on the phone first, who are members of the public. This is so we're clear what we're doing. <laughs> we're opening public comment briefly on this uh, uh, issue uh, to members of the public on the telephone. Anyone on the telephone wish to make a comment on this particular topic? All right, hearing none, are there members of the public in the room who wish to make a comment on this topic?
Okay. Hearing none, we'll close public comment on the issue and we'll move to members of the Law School Council in the RAC. I guess we can discuss together. <laughs> Just can't vote together. Just a question, what's driving this uh, proposed change? Um, here, generally, we really have been just looking at all of the different business processes that are going on and thinking about different options that might be available. Um, really just saying, if, if the process were to be begun, be begun from scratch today, what might we do? And how might we uh, relieve commissions of administrative burdens while allowing them to make the important public protection decisions that they need to make? Just a, a question or a clarification. You didn't speak to the policy development piece. It said it's conducted by CBE and staff. When you, uh, under option one, so I'm assuming the development of, of rules and guidelines that govern the accredited schools would be conducted by CBE and staff. Could you flush that out a little bit? Sure. I mean, obviously all of this is in the process of being developed, so some of the things are, are left to be worked out. Uh, CBE and the Board of Trustees are, are those that have the rule-making capability at the State Bar, but staff uh, being involved in handling the day-to-day -day functions here um, would also have a suggestion role. Um, and might have a policy role, um, much as staff does now. So for example, later in the day, we'll be showing you uh, the new 6061 forms that um, incorporate the law school feedback. So that might be a policy uh, element that the state bar staff is implementing, and that would continue to be true in the new way. Great, I had a question. Okay. So I see that option two, the outsource to uh, WASC is still alive. Um, so I remember we had a presentation where we had uh, members of the California schools specifically address the issues, the pros and cons. And you know, my memory is not as good as it used to be, but I distinctly remember having uh, the clear understanding that WASP was unfeasible from a financial point of view for virtually all of our California schools. Has there been some information that perhaps I missed or Waska said, oh, we want to do this and we're going to give the bargain discount to the California schools so that the cost to the schools is something equivalent to the current cost for our oversight? Natalie? Um, sure. So I wasn't present for that discussion, although I reviewed some of the materials that were a part of that. Uh, there's no doubt about it that the, the cost for the WASC accreditation and the yearly dues for WASC are higher. So that's a, definitely a factor that should be part of the discussion and that I think um, Joanna would say has been a very active uh, part of the board discussion as well. Um, at the same time, what we've learned uh, in looking at the Cal schools is that for at least nine of them, this is a worthwhile discussion even at the point where they're paying not only the WASC fees but also the state bar fees as well. So turns out that actually they are able to do so. That's nine. Separate, that's, that's nine. Nine. Six are, are not pursuing um, and don't have that interest as far as I know at this time. A separate issue that's going to be discussed is the role of the mandatory, uh, or the role of the unaccredited schools and um, the mandatory accreditation package that was put together by the CBE and the Board of Trustees. Um, so there is a, question, a separate question on the boards as to if that goes forward, what would be the effect on the unaccredited schools to be accredited by anybody, um, any space body, as opposed to anybody? So I don't see that as an option. Is that addressed here in this uh, appendix I? Um, it is. It is a separate proposal because it's part of the rules package that the CBE um, and the Board of Trustees had already passed after um, input from working groups that included members of RAC. So that would be something to be considered. Um, and there would be legislative changes that would need to be um, taking place for that to go forward. And those legislative changes are not in process right now. So as it exists right now, there is no mandatory path to accreditation for the unaccredited schools. But, but we do plan on, it, on including that part of that discussion in 
um, the uh, Indian Planning Side report that goes to, to the board. So we want to sort of bring that issue up as well as it relates to mandatory accreditation, as well as if not mandatory accreditation, then the option for accreditation for the online schools and, and how that plays into this discussion. Yes, yeah, so here's, Donna, here's my problem as it relates to the accreditation process for what we call the unaccredited schools, is I don't see a home for them if you're going to outsource to us. So it seems like this is a kind of unfinished business for the bar to be pushing forward to the board for a decision. Um, and it's certainly, you know, at least my view is, I mean, WASP is, I don't think is an overall feasible option if we still are going to have, as the legislature has said, and provides value to our communities, if we are going to continue to have California schools and the registered schools in the state. And the legislature's clearly said that there's clearly great reasons to have affordable legal education. It promotes diversity, which is, has to be a mandate of the state bar. Um, and going to a more expensive option, such as WASP, is going to eliminate, not increase, the number of schools. So, and this is why um, I think uh, not only I've alluded to, we you know, had a meeting with a, a number of the Cal deans, um, and um, we're talking about options. So, um, so as they said, sort of what you see on the screen are the two options that were presented to the programs committee. Um, we talked about uh, about another option that Natalie described of sort of figuring out sort of what is the, essentially sort of what is the purpose of accreditation, and you know maybe even limiting accreditation to those three items that Natalie talked about: um, uh, bar passage, um, yeah, employment, um, post law school employment, and um, and the uh, client satisfaction, customer satisfaction. We are, you know, looking at the issue of what if you treat uh, Cal accredited schools um, or the unaccredited potentially the way we do with ABA, right? So you're deemed approved um, if you are already WASC accredited. Um, so you wouldn't be part of the Cal accreditation. There, we are continuing to talk through these options um, and um, and continuing to sort of figure out what what might be the best way to go. It may be, Karen, mm -hmm. that um, we get to the board meeting in September, right? This, we don't, don't get to make the decision here, the board does. Um, and it may be we get to the board meeting and the board feels like we don't have enough answers at this point um, and, and we need to engage in some further study on this before we move forward. And to the extent that we are talking about mandatory accreditation of online school, of, I'm sorry, of um, what are now the unaccredited schools, if we were to go in the WASP direction, obviously that would mean that they would need to be WASP accredited as well. Right. And so just um, to throw a little, um, a little sway into the discussion, uh, there is actually one unaccredited school that is WASP approved, uh, but it is one of the largest schools. Um, it has 3,500 students overall in the university and about 100 students in the JD and similar programs. So uh, it's, diff it's quite different than many of the unaccredited schools. So can I just say that? I know loss is not a specialty review for law schools. That is not the same thing as the ABA accreditation. It is not the same thing as the accreditation we do. So it is an, an, a poor substitute and an expensive substitute. And what concerns me on this one is it seems like whoever's putting this together isn't ready because we don't have an issue, a, a real answer on how we're going to deal with the registered schools. So, but I did have one other thing before I get off of that tangent, um, is site inspections. I don't consider site inspections to be ministerial. I know, I, I think that was, I clamored from the moment I got on this committee. I kept on begging George, when can I go finally do a site inspection? So finally last September, I got to do the Lincoln Law School one in Sacramento. I thought it was great. I think it's great to have a practicing lawyer that's in that community doing that inspection. I've come from a different viewpoint because I'm looking at, okay, they had a ton of library things. I said, what are you guys doing about technology? What are you guys doing to get your people, as uh, Greg knows I always say, what are you guys doing to make them practice ready in today's world? And if it's simply staff function, staff is not out in the practice of law, 
they are not there as employers of these new lawyers. And I think having site inspections is not ministerial. It's not in the weeds. I think it's absolutely necessary to have our committee members participate in those site inspections. And I hope, we have to find out, that um, Lincoln Law School got some value out of my boots on the ground 30 some odd years of experience. Okay, Dean Barbieri, and then, and then uh, Jack. Thank you, Greg. Um, as Donna indicated, prior to this meeting, uh, a number of the Cal Bar Law School deans had the opportunity to, to meet with staff to share comments on this topic. And so bear with me if uh, those of you who are in attendance, if I repeat some of the comments. Um, with particular uh, emphasis on option two, the outsource to WASP, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier today, um, I've had the good fortune to be on both sides of the fence. While I was at the State Bar, in addition to overseeing the development of the bar examination and the moral character determination process, for four or five years I oversaw the accreditation and regulation of all of the non-ABA law schools in California. Uh, and now, in my capacity as Dean of JFK, um, I deal with accrediting bodies. I've served as the provost of the university. I, I, deal, I deal with WASP, we're a WASP accredited school. I deal with the ABA because our undergraduate uh, programs in a paralegal certificate and Bachelor of Arts in Legal Studies or ABA approved and accredited. Uh, we have doctoral programs in psychology uh, that are APA approved, as well as other programs, um, sports psychology, MBA programs are also accredited. Um, I am so impressed with the work of the Committee of Bar Examiners uh, and the staff that, that operates the accreditation and um, educational standards functions uh, with the office, within the Office of Admissions. It is so much better than my experience with laws with the ABA, with the APA, because there's a focus on consumer protection. Uh, students who have a problem with the school, if it's a Cal Bar accredited school, they, go, they know who to go to. They go to the State Bar of California. If a student goes to WASP or the ABA, they're not going to get immediate action. I just I've experienced it time after time after time. However, if a student who has an issue with a Cal Bar accredited school calls Natalie or Natalie's predecessors, George Leal or George Reamer or um, you know Gail Murphy or me, they got immediate attention, and the problems were addressed <clears throat> and often resolved. The also the assistance in the as Karen said. With the site inspections, um, we have, I'm WASC accredited. We had a site inspection two years ago. We won't have another site inspection for eight years. Uh, we have, uh, we've got a very you know, positive uh, review. I will not have, as a law school, because WASC accredits the university, John F. Kennedy University doesn't accredit just the law school, they don't follow up on what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis or a year-to-year -year basis. I don't have to report anything to WASP with regard to bar passage rates or admission numbers or anything like that for another six years. Whereas every year, I'm reporting things to the state bar and it is, um, as, a, as a consequence, our program is better, we're providing better education for our students, we're more responsive to to questions and uh, requests for information from the State Bar, and I have no doubt that if we, if the State Bar decides to outsource the accreditation function to WASP or some other accreditation body, that the quality of the, uh, or the, the, the level of consumer protection is going to decline. There is no doubt in my mind. And as, as Karen said, Having the site visits at our schools where there's a member of the committee, 
a member of another law school, as well as a, either a, a, a consultant or a staff member. These are people sitting in classes, evaluating the level of instruction. They're looking at syllabi. They're looking at examinations that are law examinations, and they're providing very, very valuable feedback to the schools so that the quality of legal education in California is as good as it possibly can. If, however, as we went through a law school accreditation, they never sat in on a law school class. They didn't sit in on, on they were more, frankly, they were more concerned with program and institutional learning outcomes than they were in the bar examination results and quality of the students and were involved with, uh, concerned about retention um, and making sure people graduate, whereas it was brought up, sometimes students just don't, oh, you mentioned that, are, are not in a position to uh, continue because they're not performing at an academic level and it's upon us as protecting the, the consumer to academically disqualify someone and not continue to take their time and money with hopes that they're going to be successful on the bar examination. But if WASP is there and they want to see a, a, a much higher graduation rate, that goes against what we're trying to do as to graduate only those people who have a reasonable chance of success on the bar examination. So I feel very, very strongly that option two is a bad idea and it will have a negative impact on, on the experiences uh, and the protection of, the, of the, the consumer, which is the law school students attending our schools. So Dean, or, or Dean I owe you, but first, uh, uh, Natalie Hunter needs to make a quick comment about yeah. so just a, comment. Sure, thank you. So just a quick clarification, notwithstanding uh, the fervent comments and agreement from Karen and uh, Dean, I think it's helpful to note that if the choice is to go to a WASC accreditation, then both the legislature and the state bar can still participate in the <coughs> disclosure program as they do right now, so that those scores, the first year scores, the bar exam scores, things like that, are clearly disclosed uh, to the public. Dean Gardina. Thank you. I, did, I need to follow up on the policy development especially given some of the things that you're talking about where the accreditation standards might be dramatically changed in some cases. As I understand it right now, we've already talked about the elimination of the lack and our position on that, but it seems to me there's something missing there, which is that if the Board of Trustees does vote to eliminate the Rules Advisory Committee, there's no obvious role for the California accredited law school deans to participate in helping shape um, or give feedback on or guidance or point out unintended consequences in an advisory role in the policy development. It seems to me that you've only identified perhaps working groups to be created by the staff as they deem necessary. So no standing committee as it exists now. And the only way that we would be able to participate is through the Bagley Keene public notice and public comment process. So when you say it's not completely flushed out yet, it troubles me that that might be an option presented to the board without a full understanding about how some pretty significant changes in accreditation policy might occur and what the process is for that to occur. I don't think that it's intended that a major change in the rules like that would be done without the input from many stakeholders, including, uh, of course, the law schools of all types. So I think part of the idea behind the working groups and other mechanisms would be to be brought up even on much more minor topics, but certainly a very major thing like this uh, would be a situation where a lot of stakeholder input would be critical. And I think that's wonderful. I think the thing that troubles me is that there's no standing committee or no requirement. You intend to engage the stakeholders and working groups, but there's nothing that would require you to engage stakeholders. And working groups would in no way be subject to Bagley Keene. There'd be no transparency or openness about what occurred in those meetings. And so I, we've 
stated what we wanted, our position on the Rules Advisory Committee, I think that position becomes even more important when we look at the potential changes to how policy development will occur specifically for accredited schools in the state of California. I think Dean Kloppenberg had a question. And, and I just wanted to suggest if this still really is in process and there's a chance to consider other options, the ABA also suffered, Natalie, from really, you know, that whole idea of administrative burden. And so what they did as a compromise is we moved it out to the 10-year WASC cycle. So we still report and disclose annually, but the site visits are less frequent. So that's another option. And I, to add to what Dean Barbieri and Karen said in terms of site visits, uh, especially if you're talking about local attorneys, a lot of times we know the people who are instructors and we know what their reputation is and we know if they're going to be effective um, in terms of how they practice in reality and what they're teaching students. Um, the other thing, I, I did go on an inspection and what's valuable to us is getting student comments. There's no other way that all of these students would have an opportunity to come up and voice a concern or opinion or um, praise for the school that they're attending because they're not necessarily going to write a letter, write an email, pick up the phone. If we're standing there in front of them, then yes, they comment, and we get a lot of really valuable comments that way. And the last thing was, if we do stay with a staff member, I think it's important to have a check and balance. I, I, I don't think it's right for only one person to be determining whether a school meets its requirements or not. Um, so if there's some way to incorporate the um, observations of the other two people, for example, or um, there's some way for them to see what the report is actually reporting um, to make sure that it's, it's accurate. I, I think that's important as well. Okay, I'm just uh, conscious that there might be members of the law school council on the phone that also want to contribute comments on this this matter. The rack folks in the room have aired out thoroughly, uh, as are there others in, on the phone, who, uh, members of the law school council who wish to comment. So could a member of the law school council on the phone who's not eligible to vote uh, make a comment? Because Steve Prager had sent me one. Oh, I don't know she if I can read that comment. into it. She can comment. She okay. can't vote. You can comment, Steve Prager. Prager. No, she, uh, <coughs> she can't Thank comment you. as a member of um, I'm sorry, Dean Prager. She can't oh, comment as a member of the public because she's actually a member of the committee. But because that she didn't get her um, call-in address on in time, that's why she can't participate as a member of the committee. And in defense of Dean Prager, she had hoped to attend in person and properly prepare for that. And then an unexpected circumstance made her unavailable. So she took every step to prepare and uh, participate. Thank you for doing that, Dean Prager. So I guess the procedural um, question is, am I allowed to read a quote from her? Did she email me or is that not proper? Um, you know, I, I don't think that would be proper. Thanks for trying, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other comments from uh, members of the Law School Council? Yes, this is Robin Strauss. Um, I'm looking at the law website right now, and looking at the law school, there does not appear to be a single law accredited program that isn't associated with another larger institution. Uh, do we know if there are any freestanding WASP accredited law schools that aren't associated with other schools? Um, San Joaquin School of Law uh, would be one of those schools, and there are some in the candidacy process, uh, but there would be primarily, uh, there are not too many. Okay. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. 
Oh, that's true, yeah. They say it was only a law school. That's true. Actually, my law school, I should have known that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, we're in this difficult moment again about kind of wrapping up this issue. And uh, Erica, I'd like to pass it over if the law school council has any motion or vote or anything they want to do before we wrap, move on to the other items that are on the rack agenda, which we should get to. I think you just have your... Um, can, I, can I make a comment before you move on real fast? Uh, Joanna Mendoza again. Um, I just wanted to just give uh, some basic understanding of why we are even doing this to um, help everyone wrap their heads around this issue. And we have been um, questioning how qualified we are to be accrediting schools, whether or not staff is properly qualified, whether or not the Committee of Bar Examiners members who sit for a few for four years in the group off are actually qualified to do this. And we have pressure from um, outside the bar regarding the number of volunteers that we use for work like this. So we're having to take a hard look at it. Now, Karen, I would never question your confidence on anything. I just want to make that clear. But uh, it's one of the reasons that we are looking at this and trying to determine if we are qualified to be doing it, and if so, who's most qualified in our organization to keep it to continue doing this type of work. We haven't really looked at how well we're doing it, whether or not we're conforming to best practices with regard to accreditation and so forth. So it's just that's the context. I want everyone to understand nobody's being attacked. We've been asked to look at the number of volunteers we use and whether or not it's appropriate for some of these functions. So that's what we're looking at. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, so, Eric, let me just hand it over to you in terms of running the meetings parts regarding the law school council. Okay. And, and I will jump in on the tail end of that. I think the issue is regulations. If the regulations are written by people who are qualified, and there's not a question about that. The issue of whether a school meets those qualifications, that should be obvious. That should be obvious to anybody who walks in and looks. Does this library uh, meet the standard? Are these students having their needs met? That doesn't require any kind of expertise. It just requires somebody to be able to apply the regulations and determine are they met or are they not. It's very simple. So in ter as far as having somebody who's qualified, uh, I don't think that that's the issue. I think the issue, if you're concerned about uh, qualifications, it really should be whoever is writing those regulations that we need to be concerned about. Uh, not the people who are determining if those regulations are met. And with that, I'll open it to, I, I believe we had comment from some of the members, but is there any public um, comment here? Okay. Uh, is, do we have any motion? So I would make a motion on behalf of the Law School Council to uh, reject the proposed changes by the staff uh, as it relates to law school accreditation. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion with the law school council members? Okay, if we could have roll. Okay. Johnson? Poppenberg? Aye. Strauss? Aye. Goodman? Aye. Paramatsu? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Mendoza? Abstain. Thank you. Dean Susan Prager has left the conference. All right, so just so again, to wrap this up, uh, on the rack side, are there any motions on the rack side? Okay, so just 
this today. So today's my well, since it's my last day, it's my, <laughs> my day to make my motion. So I would I would make the same motion on behalf of RAP that uh, we would reject the proposed changes by staff. So uh, to be really clear, there are two options, and the motion is to to adopt neither of these specified options. Yes, that's true. And so the motion essentially is a motion to retain the status. The current state of yes. things with yes. respect to accreditation. Yes. Okay. Just to be sure that that's clear. And a second, or is there a second, I should say? I'll second. And is there further discussion? Okay. Call the roll, please. Barbara Harry? Aye. Brandis? Aye. Ardina? Aye. Goodman? Aye. Aramatsu? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously on the rack. Uh, all right, so let's move to our next item, which, uh, if I recall correctly, is our draft minutes of the June 21 uh, rack meeting. And uh, it's customary to ask if anyone has any edits or variations to those minutes. Prager. Join the conference. <laughs> okay, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as written. I'll move to approve. Moved by Goodman. I'll second. Second by Hiramatsu. And any discussion? No. All those in favor? Right. You can voice vote on this. On minutes approval? Oh, okay, so you do roll call for Oh, roll call, call the roll, roll approving the minutes. Roll. This is rack only. Only rack may vote. Okay. For the rack, uh, Barbary? Aye. Brandis? Yes. Gardena? Aye. Goodman? Aye. Hiramatsu? Lynn? Aye. Okay. And minutes are approved. Actually, uh, as uh, attaching to that, we need the minutes for the law school council also to be approved. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Can, um, you have two meetings right now, yeah. so I don't know how you do that. We don't have agenda items for the law school council noted on the agenda. But we do have a recruit the minutes. We'd like to do it because of that being clocked in the meeting of the tree. Do you have minutes? Yeah. There were minutes of the, of the rack, but were the minutes? Yes. 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 Right. yes. Right. 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 Okay. They should be approved. Okay. Voting. Johnson. Kloppenberg. Aye. Approved. Strauss. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Hiramatsu. Aye. Lynn. Aye. Mendoza. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, that moves us then uh, to the chair's report, and I only have one item in my chair's report, and that is. Uh, that it's, it's possible this will be the last meeting of the Rules Advisory Committee. Uh, this agenda item, as far as I know, is still uh, on the agenda for the board to consider on the 13th and 14th of September, which is before our next scheduled meeting. Uh, so I would say a couple of things about that. One is be sure you pay attention to the 13th and 14th so you'll know whether we're getting together again at the next, at the next session. Um, it uh, obviously depends on a lot of things, but uh, then in that regard, I would also say it's been a great pleasure uh, to uh, work with all of you and serve in this period of time as your chair. I think we've done a lot of good things, and as I think today's meeting uh, demonstrates, there's an importance to the forum to kind of hash these things out and provide import input of value to the ultimate decision makers. Um, and as today's votes rec uh, demonstrate, it's, in my experience, been conducted uh, very collegially, uh, very cooperatively, and over the years, everyone has worked extremely hard to reach that spot where consensus could be found, and in most cases, unanimous votes. So uh, I appreciate everybody's contribution. Um, I would also note that in my chair's report that uh, my term is coming to an end on the rack, and so even if the rack is still around, I may not be with you <laughs> for much longer. So again, the same appreciations 
apply, and that's that's the only piece that I have in my chair's report. Which brings us to the staff update, which is uh, begins with the timeline for the rules on accrediting distance learning law schools. Thank you, Greg, as I turn off my mic. Uh, so I have several uh, options, and I'm, I'm aware of the time, so I will try to be brief. I'm, I'm here as long as you need me, but I know that many of you have planned to be here just till 5. Um, with respect to the approved package of rules and guidelines that included both mandatory accreditation and online rules, uh, we've been looking at options to tease apart the portion of those rules that would not need further rule changes or legislative action um, regarding online schools. And you can see with the broad nature of the discussion today, it would be premature. Sarah Pearson, Dean, San Joaquin College of Law. And left the conference. To try to <laughs> implement um, a package of rules at this time with this type of decision pending. Um, and in addition, with the types of changes pending that the CBE um, has already requested and frankly, the very large number of questions that we've received from the deans themselves, which we welcome, and we continue to um, encourage you to uh, ask questions that you might have regarding those. So they definitely are still front and center, um, along with a large number of things, and we're trying to think about a reasonable way and time to see um, how as many of those rules can be implemented as soon as practical. Okay, so uh, uh, discussion on the rack again. This is just strictly rack now, uh, regarding uh, this uh, status. Those rules. Yeah, I do have a question. Uh, so I'm re uh, recognizing that you were presenting as quickly as you could, and, and recognizing and appreciating that you were presenting as quickly as you could. Uh, you mentioned that there were a lot of questions from deans. Are those questions from deans about? Those rules? Uh, they Are you receiving a lot of questions about those rules? Yes. Well, either about those rules or about different situations applicable to those rules, yes. Okay. All right. Because of the a general interest in distance education, you're getting inquiries from schools and they would therefore relate to those rules, I take it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to be sure clear about that. Those rules are the product, I'm, saying, I'm going to keep saying this, as long as I have a pulpit to say it in, uh, of a nearly six or almost more than six year process at this point, uh, and thoroughly vetted repeatedly in public comment, voted three times by the Committee of Bar Examiners, voted twice by the Board of Trustees. I mean, you've heard me say this a million times. Uh, at this point, uh, there should be no question as to whether those rules are approved. Uh, the, it, it frankly looks very bad, I have to say, that the State Bar is not proceeding with these rules in an expeditious manner. On November 5th, they will have been approved by the board for final time for a full year. And uh, so I recognize that it's kind of caught up in all of this stuff, and it should not be. And I wish to go on record saying that that's a great tragedy, that it is caught up in that, in that process. And obviously, uh, having spent all those six years working on it, I feel very strongly about this one. So you knew that was coming, I expect. You bet. Other, other comments on this? All right, let's move to the next item on our staff report. Okay, the next item is uh, the MPR, the Minimum Cumulative Pass Rate, uh, which is a requirement uh, for the Cal schools. Uh, this will be discussed tomorrow uh, for the first time since 2015 at, uh, the, at the Committee of Bar Examiners. Uh, so we know for a time that we were unable to release the pass list that made this easy to calculate, but now that we can release them, uh, the schools did a wonderful job of timely reporting and timely working with the bar to uh, figure out any discrepancies uh, between them. And so uh, we'll be presenting that tomorrow. But hopefully people had a good experience. We tried to give you a little bit more information than we had in the past to make it easier. And I will uh, particularly thank Christina Dole, our program manager, uh, for, uh, for the grading process who worked very hard to give you those five years worth of past lists, um, as well as the new definition of takers uh, to make this easy. First time through, it was a very manual, time-consuming process as a busy time of year, but she prioritized the schools and made it happen. So thank you, Christina. Incredibly appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, just thank you to everyone. And uh, there'll be further discussion tomorrow, but could take any questions today. 
members of RAC again. Okay, let's move on then to our next is 6061.7. Sure. Um, under California Business and Professions Code, uh, both the unaccredited and the Cal accredited schools are required to post some disclosures on their website every January. Um, and they are a range of different things about admissions, tuition, financial aid, bar passage, et cetera. Um, and we had discussed the possibility of having the Cal schools repost their scores after the release of this NPR because the NPR figures that everyone has been posting um, are now three years old. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, in working with the Cal schools, we have not yet had time to afford the same opportunity to the unaccredited schools. Uh, so the Cal schools will not be required to repost, um, but we did take into account the comments and feedback provided at the RAC last month about the form and how to make the form easier to use. So uh, for those of you that would like to stay around or have a copy mailed to you to look at the draft form, uh, you're welcome to do that and to see the incorporation of uh, your feedback. Thank you. So, so Natalie, do, do I understand that you brought copies for a conversation around it? Um, I did bring copies. Uh, it's probably not very easy to have a conversation about a full uh, disclosure form here in the RAC, but uh, we, I'd be happy to make this available. Well, I don't want to shortcut it if it's something important for you to have. Uh, so I think you, you um, are saying that we will not be requiring people to repost, and therefore this item could safely be put over to another time. In other words, input to you on the form changes could safely be put over to another time? I'm just trying to understand the, because I don't want to shortcut it because the time is important. Sure. I think that here the changes are, uh, there are no changes to the business and professions code. So there are no changes of any kind to what the schools report. We have merely made formatting changes to make the form easier to handle. Um, and so, uh, we do not have the privilege to change that which the legislature asked to the schools to disclose. Um, and so I think that uh, it would be helpful to receive formatting comments today only because when the annual report forms go out, embedded in those forms will be some of these questions to prepare you. And I'd like to have those annual forms match. But I think you'll find the changes are, are nip and tuck, uh, changes made to make it um, more clear for the folks putting this together at the schools. All right, so now you now you said something that makes me think maybe we should look at this because mm -hmm. the forms for the annual report are being finalized now. Yes. And need to be out In urgently. In September. Yeah. So are you saying that changes to this form will change the annual report form? Uh, or? Not really. So let me give you an, an example of a specific change. I think this will make it much easier. So for example, when you look at the employment outcomes, those employment outcomes are based on a three-year trend. So for the current form, uh, you would look at employment status of 2014 grads, um, how they did in 2015, 2016, and 2017 in terms of employment. Uh, often staff um, at the schools were confused by that, and they would give us not how 2014 grads are doing in each of those three years, but rather how 2014 did, how 2015 did, how 2016 did. Um, so now we've clearly changed the form to say, look at this class for each of the three years. So I think the changes are, um, are minimal. Okay. All with right. that being probably the most complex example of any change on the form. Okay. And they don't uh, substantively change the questions that are on the annual report form and we're not substantively changing the questions on here or the data report on here because we can't. Correct. Okay. And there aren't Correct. additional questions, there aren't, no. there's no additional report, data no. being reported. No. Okay. All right. If people can just ask for a copy from Natalie, um, would you be able to email it if somebody on the phone wanted to see it? Absolutely. And, and make whatever comments to Natalie uh, as far as uh, input goes. Yes. Natalie, just so I understand, uh, originally you wanted us to repost. What I'm hearing from you is we don't need to repost an updated form until the January 1st date. That 
it was originally. Correct, and the reason being, uh, we learned since the last meeting that now the Cal schools have the materials needed to post a 2018 NPR score, but the unaccredited schools do not yet have those materials, so you would be posting uh, different years. So to allow you to have consistent posting, we need more time for the unaccredited schools to hopefully have the good experience that you Cal schools have had. Yes. Just a point. Calculating the NPR is not a good experience. <laughs> but, but working with the state bar was a good experience. <laughs> Calculating it is a complex experience, which is why I'm trying to work hard to give you what you need to make it the best experience possible. Okay, thank okay, you. Great. Uh, so, uh, anything else on that? I assume not. Okay. Let's go on then to uh, our fourth item on the staff report, and that's status of the reviews of web uh, compliance, uh, web communications for compliance with 2.3 D3. Yes. D3. Yeah. So, uh, the state bar staff has been going through um, and looking at the websites in advance of the annual reports to assess compliance, and when the schools do not. Um, have the proper disclosure or they're not in the proper location, uh, we've been making courtesy calls out to the schools. And a general learning that we've made is that sometimes the folks who take care of the web are different than the folks who take care of the administration. And um, it's been helpful to put those two back in, con in contact. So I would encourage uh, the deans to have their staff be talking to the IT folks often to make sure that those disclosures are updated and they're in the right place at the right time. Uh, because sometimes the deans have actually been surprised. Hey, I provided that IT, IT at some time ago. I thought it was not up and you know, within minutes it is in fact up. So I would continue to encourage that collaboration. All right. Uh, comments or questions from the craft on that one? Okay, sounds good. Thank you for the staff reports on those things. The last item we have on our agenda is the 2018 RAP goals. Uh, now, we're, as I said, um, uh, ending my term, certainly as your chair, and you know, chairs really want to try to achieve the goals that the group set for themselves during that period of time. Uh, there's a number of these items on here that we're not going to achieve, uh, clearly. So uh, you have my uh, regret that I wasn't able to complete those items. And uh, given the lateness of the hour, we won't go through them uh, one by one. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, are there any items that anyone wants to remove from the goals at this point? No. Uh, I did want to say one thing, though. I still think, and I see item number one's minimum competence, which I think was a very important goal. And it's, um, I share. Uh, Greg's concerns that we weren't able to achieve the goal. It was through no fault of either the committee or this uh, group here that we didn't, we weren't able to really do the appropriate uh, analysis and have a discussion on what constitutes minimum competence for first year law school. So assuming we have RAC next year in some form, and assuming we, the committee of our examiners is able to have any policy discussions next year, after the board does whatever vote it does, I would hope that they, they, they keep a close eye on what this working group is going to do with minimum competence. Um, and I think that's something in the future that, that everybody here should be very concerned about. All right, thank you. Are there, are there other comments? Okay, so if there are no other comments on the goals, then uh, that, that, that brings us to the end of our meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second by Gardena. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> 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 <laughs>